So we're going to talk about DNA replication today in chapter 16, the process of DNA making an entire copy of the overall DNA code. Cells are only going to do this if they're preparing for cell division. So this is uh, when signaled, a cell will copy its DNA and in interphase, if you recall from previous conversations. And all we're doing here is we're going to zoom into the process of how that copying works at the molecular level. Um, after it finishes copying, it's going to proceed either into mitosis or meiosis in a eukaryotic cell, or binary fission if it's a prokaryotic cell. So how do you do replication? There are going to be three basic steps that we're going to talk about and a few enzymes. So the first idea is that the code has to be opened up. We have to break the, the hydrogen bonds between the nitrogen base code in the middle so that we can then copy each strand. We can attach new pairing nitrogen bases to the exposed strands. So there's going to be uh, two enzymes responsible for helping to open up the code. We're going to talk about the roles of helicase and topoisomerase. Step two is going to be to actually build the copy strands themselves. So we're going to see that that involves a temporary RNA primer and another enzyme called DNA polymerase that builds the new copy polymer. And then we're going to replace the RNA as I suggested and then we just need one further enzyme DNA ligase to glue together the copy strands to make sure they're fully continuous, um, which I'll describe here in just a minute. This follows what we call the semi-conservative model of replication. So it's the idea that each copy is sort of half old. One of the strands is the old parental strand. And one of the strands in each copy is the new copy strand. So they're showing you here, perhaps um, in blue, the original DNA being split up. And then you see the green arrows show the copy strands being formed. So each copy there will be half old, half new. We're sort of conserving the original copy of the DNA in each of the two copies. How does this process get started? As it turns out, we, uh, there is a particular series of DNA code that the helicase recognizes, binds to, and starts to open up the code right there. And it's not actually at an end of a piece of DNA code. Um, it's actually right in the middle. So we call this the origin of replication. And there are actually two helicases that continue to open up the code in either direction. So um, this is actually showing you here a typical eukaryote that might have multiple origins of replication in one DNA strand. So those bubbles, as they sort of open and, and spread, will eventually meet each other, um, with the goal here at the bottom of completely separating the original strands of DNA, and then you've got two copy strands. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to imagine that we're going to look at one of these replication bubbles, and we're just going to look at one half of it. So here um, I have uh, created a very crude drawing here, uh, showing you that perhaps helicase is continuing to open up code toward the left side here. Um, what's the role of topoisomerase then? Topoisomerase would be further upstream. It would be further to the left of helicase in this little example. And the idea of topoisomerase is if you've ever tried to untwist something by opening it up in the middle, um, you'll notice that it immediately gets super twisted kind of right around where you open it up. Um, if your iPod headphones get all tangled up and you just try to untwist it by pulling it apart from the middle, um, it just it gets it more twisted, perhaps, um, in the places that you're uh, right around the place you're opening it up. And so the same thing would happen with the DNA double helix. If helicase were just to open it up and start to um, uh, uh, open it right in the middle, then it would get super twisted. And so the role of topoisomerase then is just to counter twist a little bit ahead of helicase to make sure that the DNA doesn't get super twisted as this process is occurring. So you've basically got helicase and topoisomerase that are working in pairs to open up the DNA code. Let's say that this part of the DNA code has already opened here. And then we're ready to copy. So let's talk a little bit about how the copying works. Um, it's important to know how the DNA directionality goes. Um, this convention of saying that DNA faces from 5 prime towards 3 prime. So let's say that this top original strand is facing this way. Um, that's the way we, we indicate the directionality of DNA strands. Um, and it's important that if the top 
original strand is facing that way, then the bottom strand must be facing the opposite way. So 5 would go towards 3 in the opposite direction. Um, complementary DNA strands are anti-parallel to each other. They're parallel, but they're facing in opposite directions. And that's going to be important because the copy strands will also have to be anti-parallel to the strand they're copying. So eventually, there will be a copy strand of the top strand, and it will have to face in the opposite direction of the original strand. And then there will be a copy of the bottom original strand as well, and it will also have to face in the opposite direction. So why does that matter? That matters in replication and in transcription, as it turns out, because whenever you're building a copy polymer of a nucleic acid, uh, the, the polymerases that build the copy strand can only add nucleotides in the 5 to 3 direction. So they have to add them in a particular direction, and that's going to create consequences for how the two, strand, the two copy strands are going to be made. So let's talk about that kind of one by one here. Let's talk about the top copy first. So the other thing to note about replication is that DNA nucleotides cannot immediately be added by themselves. Um, there actually has to be something called an RNA primer that's added first, and then the DNA polymerases can continue to add off that primer. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show some red nucleotides coming in. So here is an A that pairs with T in RNA language, and I'm showing the nitrogen base letter A and the sugar phosphate group that, that is part of that nucleotide. That's what the um, little line is here. And that's added first. Um, and perhaps a short primer is added, so I'm going to show a U um, pairing with A next to it. And the enzyme is actually called primase that adds the RNA primer. I'm not too concerned with that. And it's going to link the nucleotides together to form a short polymer. So typically an RNA primer might be, say, 10 to 15 nucleotides long. I'm just going to show one that's two nucleotides long for the purposes of simplicity. So once the RNA primer is laid, it can be laid down without anything being there at first. But now that the RNA primer is laid down, DNA polymerase can come in and lay down DNA nucleotides off of the old primer, still in the 5 to 3 direction. So it can add a G to pair with C. I'm going to show the new DNA code in white here to differentiate it from the RNA primer. So it can add that G, and then it can connect the sugar phosphate backbones to the RNA primer. So it can link them together and make it a DNA polymer. Um, it can uh, add a T next um, to pair with the A of the old code um, and link together the sugar phosphate backbones. And it can continue to proceed in this 5 to 3 direction. I'm just going to go ahead and show the sugar phosphate backbones um, already being connected here. So pairing up A, pairing up C with G, pairing up C, pairing up A, pairing up G, pairing up T. Notice again that DNA has the letter thymine instead of uracil in RNA code. And the idea is that it can continue, since this uh, top copy strand, since it is proceeding in the 5 to 3 dire direction, in the same direction that helicase is opening up more code, it will really just need that one initial primer over here. And then it will just be able to continuously add DNA code as helicase opens up more code in front of it. So it's just going to be able to follow helicase continuously. We call this idea the leading strand. Okay. However, the bottom copy strand will face kind of a different challenge. Um, its 5 to 3 direction that it must add code is actually opposite that of helicase opening up more code on this half of the replication bubble. So what I'm going to ask you to imagine is I'm going to ask you to imagine that maybe the only the right half of the code is open at this point. Um, so let's say that it can lay down an RNA primer as it must, just like the leading strand had to. So let's just say that um, A pairs with U down here. Um, and uh, the RNA primer can then add an A next to it in the 5 to 3 direction and connect the sugar phosphate backbone. Let's just make it a two um, nucleotide length RNA primer here for simplicity. Then DNA polymerase can take over and add DNA letters in the 5 to 3 direction. So C, pair up the, the sugar phosphate backbone, A, and then T. And then it's going to have to stop. 
because, uh, you know, as I'm showing here at least, there's no more code to add in that direction, it's going to have to wait for helicase to open up more code behind it, and then it will have to start once again with a primer. So um, let's say that the, the next five letters have been opened up, and so it can add an RNA primer of A and C and connect them together. Then once again, DNA polymerase can come in and add off the primer, T, G, G. And it's going to have to add um, uh, code in these little fragments because it's going to have to wait for helicase to open up more code, then it can lay down a primer, then it can add a short sequence of DNA code before it hits the old primer, and then it's just going to have to repeat. And we call this idea of adding the code in little fragments the lagging strand. Okay. Um, so how can we finish out the replication story here? Um, eventually, the, co the RNA code will have to be replaced. And it can be replaced because now we have DNA code right next to the RNA primer in all cases. Remember how DNA polymerase could only add code when there's already an existing piece of, of DNA there. Um, so we can now start to replace this RNA primer with a different DNA polymerase. So let's go down to the UA at the bottom first, and we can see that a DNA polymerase can come in and kick out the, uh, the RNA U and make it a DNA T and connect it in the 5 to 3 direction with the nucleotide right behind it. It can also replace the RNA letter A with a DNA letter A and connect it. Now you might ask, um, it seems important to replace the uracil U's with thymine T's because they're obviously different chemicals, uh, but you might ask, what's the point of replacing an RNA letter A with a DNA letter A? Um, the nitrogen base adenine is the exact same, but recall that DNA and RNA have different sugars in the phosphate sugar backbone. So it's still important to replace all of the RNA primer letters because we want a DNA code with DNA sugars in the backbone. So there's um, one final consideration here. The DNA polymerase was capable of replacing all of the letters, and it was capable of connecting those new DNA letters with the sugar phosphate backbone immediately behind it, but it can't actually make up that final gap um, when the primer is finally replaced. So that's DNA ligase's job. DNA ligase's job is to finish gluing together the sugar phosphate backbone of sort of the replaced primer. So that little gap right there will be filled in by DNA ligase. So let's continue to replace the RNA primer here. Um, let's go over to AC on the bottom strand, and we'll see that the A could be replaced by a DNA letter A. This is presuming that there's more code opened up that I'm not showing here that it can attach to. The, the RNA letter C is replaced by a DNA letter C and connected with the A. And DNA ligase will have to come in and seal and finish gluing together the sugar phosphate backbone. This actually happens in the leading strand as well. So presuming once again that there's code behind this RNA letter A, um, DNA polymerase could come in and replace it with a DNA letter A. It could replace that uracil with a DNA letter T, and then DNA ligase could come in and finish the job. Please notice, um, just humor me and look really carefully at the top half of this diagram, and then look at the bottom half of this diagram. Um, convince yourself that those are exact copies of each other. Remember, that's the point of replication. Okay, so let's just sum up. Um, what were the basic steps of DNA replication? Uh, you have to open up the code first. Helicase and topoisomerase worked together to do that. We're splitting apart the hydrogen bonds between the nitrogen bases in the middle of the DNA double helix. RNA primer had to get, uh, be laid down first to start any copy strand. We said that DNA polymerase had to then add off of the RNA primer in the 5 to 3 direction. Um, that's important because that creates strands that are added in different ways, a leading strand and a lagging strand. Then the, uh, uh, and wh how, uh, what is the leading strand again? The leading strand is when the 5 to 3 direction that DNA polymerase adds is in the same direction as helicase is opening up more code. What's the lagging strand again? That's when the 5 to 3 direction of a DNA polymerase is opposite that of helicase opening up more code. Uh, DNA polymerase, another DNA polymerase, can actually replace the RNA primer eventually. Uh, 
And finally, DNA ligase has to finish the job by making the final connection between the sugar and phosphate backbone of the copy strands to make sure it's one continuous polymer.